All right. Um, Góðan daginn öll sem vel og velkomin á hérna, mánægilegan fund hjá Space Iceland. Það er hérna, alltaf ánægja að við getum haldið þessa fundi og sérstaklega kannski þrátt fyrir COVID. Nú er þeir hérna, á netinu en okkur hlakkar nú reynda til að, að hittast svo öll í, í kjötöfum aftur. Uh, þetta er síðasti fundurinn fyrir hérna, jólin og við bara hérna, ætlum að fara svona aðeins yfir árið og, og svo ætlar hann Andrew Kú hjá hérna, Gemvistastofnum Bretlands að fjalla aðeins um samstarfsmöguleika og hérna samstarfsmöguleika við Ísland en við ætlum að hérna, byrja, hann verður á ensku fundurinn, hann er það svissa bara yfir á ensku so welcome everyone to this uh, monthly meeting at Space Iceland. Uh, as usual, we'll do, uh, do this meeting in, in English. We actually did have an event in Icelandic um, earlier this week. That was our first event that was entirely in Icelandic, so that was, that was a pleasure. Um, so with us today is Andrew Koo at the UK Space Agency. He's going to tell us a bit about what the UK has been doing in space and how they've developed the sector and there's there's quite a lot of sort of new and exciting things happening over there uh as always these meetings are quite informal uh we start with uh just a short overview of, of what's happening at space iceland we'll take a few minutes for that and then um i'll give andrew q the uh andrew q sorry the floor and um you'll do a short presentation we will um also be accepting uh, questions or any comments. So you can either message them in our chat and Alpha will uh, take care of them, or you can just let her know in the chat that you want to ask a question. So I'm just gonna give you a short overview of what we've been doing here at Space Iceland lately. Um, as we've mentioned, and you probably noticed from our newsletters, we are a little bit overrun uh, with work in 2020, it's been um, a fantastic year, and I do believe that the sort of the initial um, work of normalizing the idea of a space sector in Iceland is actually well on its way. I think we've uh, been able to um, kind of emphasize and amplify all the contributions that Iceland has made in the past, and and also our ambition that perhaps the country kind of takes, um, or we take the driving seat when it comes to developing our sector rather than just being reactive. Um, on the policy front, we're actually quite happy that the idea of, or the need for a national space plan is, plan is sort of getting some traction. So I think that 2021 will be the year where Space Iceland in particular has to kind of step up our engagement with the sector and, and start in a uh, sort of a more focused way and a strategic way developing uh, the first steps of a policy. Obviously, one of the major thing there is uh, publishing the, the mapping of strengths and opportunities that we've been doing. Um, uh, most of that work was happening last summer where we have we're ha fortunate enough to have quite a few researchers join us and there is some work still being finalized and uh that should give us a roadmap on on kind of where we need to emphasize uh the policy work and and which sections of the sector we need to work more closely with um and well, uh, what I can say is that most of the work now and until the end of the year is trying to, is trying to finalize um, some framework or, or, or drafts on how we can um, um, join sort of major partnerships with, with some um, in either in particular projects or, or with some uh, cooperative partners for the next year uh, and then what we're also doing right now is we're still collecting data on the rocket launch this year and mostly 
mostly we are collecting data on how it was handled on the government side. So we've sent in uh, heaps and heaps of freedom of information requests, and we're kind of trying to map out where the weaknesses were, were what kind of, which part of the legal framework is maybe severely underdeveloped. And then we'll um, start discussions with the authorities on, on, on potential improvements. But I'm not going to uh, say much more. If there are any questions, you can obviously send them and we'll uh, answer them in chat. But I want to uh, welcome Andrew and um, just thank him and the UK Space Agency for uh, accepting an invitation to speak at a, one of our meetings. So Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Thor, and um, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's been really good to hear about the work that Space Iceland has been doing over the past weeks and months. So, um, yeah, really pleased to, to be here speaking with you today. Um, I'm going to share my screen as I put together a few slides. So bear with me one moment whilst I do that. Okay, so start the presentation. So, uh, can as everybody see that? Okay, before I get started. Yep, looks good at this end at least. Very good. I'm still getting my head around all this remote presentation, and I, I wish I could be there in, in Reykjavik today rather than speaking to you remotely from sunny Bristol in the UK. Um, but hopefully, uh, next year things will clear up a little in that respect. So my name's Andrew Koo. I'm head of international space flight policy at the UK Space Agency. Uh, so in a nutshell, that means I, I handle the international relations connected to our launch program. Um, so that means talking with countries um, all around the world about different aspects of launch where they may be interested or, or have some involvement with us. So today I'm going to speak a little about the UK Space Agency. I'm not sure how familiar all of you will be with, with our work, so I'll give an overview of who we are, what we do, and, and an overview of the, the UK space sector and our, our particular priorities and, and strategy. I'll speak a little more specifically about the, the area of work that uh, I'm directly involved with, which is uh, our space flight program, often uh, branded as Launch UK. And then I'll speak a little about our future work as well. Um, and I think we've got a, a good chunk of time at the end for some Q&A. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have, um, whether that's particularly on the launch programme or more broadly on UK space policy. So UK Space Agency leading the UK into a new space age. This is kind of our, our top level vision statement. Um, I won't read that all out for you. Um, but this really sets the direction and, and is, uh, I guess, our raison d'etre for, for the UK Space Agency. Um, we are the civil space agency in the UK, so all civil space programmes we, we take an interest in. Uh, there is separate military interest, but, but there's a clear divide between those in, in the UK. Um, and we provide a, a clear single voice for UK space ambitions. So to give you an idea of where we've come from, um, I was speaking to Thor about this um, earlier, in fact, there wasn't a UK space agency um, just over 10 years ago. We had lots of interest in space across different bits of the UK government. So uh, we had the Natural Environment Research Council who funded some space programmes. We had the Science and Technology Facilities Council who funded particularly astronomy missions and things like that. Um, and we had uh, other sections of government that did licensing and, and so on. So we had quite a disparate space sector. So the government realised the need for there to be, a, to be a single voice and a single agency. And that's really given us uh, critical mass to grow the sector and to, to uh, improve what the UK does in space. And so, as it says there, we'll deliver an excellent collaborative space programme with economic scientific and policy benefit for the UK. So our role is really bringing those three strands together. What we don't do is we don't uh, deliver most of the programmes. We have an excellent uh, network of universities and industrial partners across the UK. 
So when it comes to the actual building and testing the spacecraft, that's that's undertaken by our partners. So in terms of who we are, it's a bit of a busy slide. This I think the the idea is to show the, you know the sheer range of things that that we're involved in in the UK now. We have around two hundred staff. I think that might be closer to. 250 or maybe 300 now since this slide was put together um, and they're based across three locations in the UK so that's uh, an office in London, an office in Swindon which is about 80 miles to the west of London and another office in Harwell in Oxfordshire where there's a, a growing space hub. So we have a UK-wide business support network and we manage the UK's involvement in European Space Agency missions and programmes. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And we provide science and industrial support. Um, that's through policy and strategy initiatives, but it's also through direct funding for, for universities and industry. A really key part of what we do is engaging with other government departments. As I said, there used to be a very uh, disparate spread of responsibility for space in the UK. There's still lots of other government departments who have an interest in space or or maybe use uh, space assets sometimes without even necessarily realizing that so we we have an important role to play coordinating those uh, different departments across governments um, and also working with partner countries to make sure that we uh, where it's beneficial for all we have uh, joined up policies and joined up approaches to space we are an executive agency of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So we work very closely with um, BEIS is what we shorten it to, uh, B-E-I-S. Uh, we work very closely with them to, um, to deliver our, our, our policies. And, um, but we have a lot of devolved responsibility for, for setting policy. And that's, I think, one of the real strengths of the UK Space Agency after the, over the past decade is that we have been able to set policy and strategy and delivery and to have all those functions in, in one organisation. It's probably worth saying that 10 years ago when the agency first started, um, I actually joined three days before we became a, a full executive agency and there was something like 20 staff. And now with, with over 200, um, it's been quite a rapid pace of growth. In terms of how we work, we've got four kind of main pillars of, of how the agency delivers it work, its work. So we seek to embed space as a fundamental part of the UK economy and society. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of how we see our role. Uh, it's not just exploring space because it's fun and it gets people excited. Like, it is fun and it does get people excited, but that's not our purpose. It's about making sure there's benefit for people back on Earth. And that's a message which we're really keen to reiterate. Um, we want to build a world where space tackles global challenges and is used responsibly, safely and securely by all. I think that's a really important issue, something that's getting increasingly complex um, and on which there's Ever, ever changing uh, kind of global policies that we, we have to engage with. We work with partners undertaking science and discovery. And this is really um, core to a lot of the agency's work, science and discovery. You can't do these other things unless you have strong science and, and research programs um, and vice versa. There's a mutual benefit there. And we want to place the UK, UK at the forefront of international collaboration as a global partner with a compelling vision. Uh, these are all the lovely warm words that people uh, like to hear. But for us, that is really important. We can't deliver everything uh, unilaterally as the UK and collaborating is, is beneficial for us and for our partners. So I mentioned the European Space Agency already. Um, Despite the uh, recent changes in our membership of the EU, um, it's probably worth saying we're a founding member of the European Space Agency and we remain a fully committed member state of ESA. Um, and it's, it's a separate organisation um, to the EU and, and we intend to stay a, a full member of ESA. So the last ESA ministerial meeting 
So these are the, the big meetings in ESA where all the ministers from the member states get together and agree the, the funding programme and priorities for the agency over the coming period. Uh, we committed 1.6 billion euros to ESA programmes over the next five years. Uh, so I won't give you a full breakdown of that, but that's across a whole range of different programmes um, from kind of fundamental research and development right through to, to applications. And we are the leading funder of the telecommunications program, uh, earth observation programs and navigation as well. So those you can see from that, those are three big priority areas for the UK and areas in which we've um, we've led the way on several missions um, over the past, well, over the past several decades, really. These are real areas of, of both uh, industrial and academic strength within the UK. The European Centre for Space Applications and Telecommunications, which we, we shortened to EXAT, is, is based in the UK. So that's one of ESA's um, main centres. So, so they now have a, a fairly large presence. Um, that's based in, in Harwell. That's the uh, top image you can see on this slide. Um, and in Harwell, there's various uh, companies and um, research organisations uh, based around that, that cluster. And uh, we are a world leader in, in science outputs from ESA missions. The science programme, unlike certain other programmes, well, unlike most programmes in ESA, is what they call a mandatory programme. So that means every member state participates, unlike the optional programmes where member states can choose whether or not to engage in those. Um, every member state is in the science programme. And um, yeah, we've seen a, a lot of good return for that on that for our science community. We help space companies start and grow across the whole of the UK. Um, so we're really keen in making sure we can support uh, small companies and startups. Um, so we have a network of space business incubators, which have been really successful over the years of, of spinning out technologies and, and developing new companies. So we've got a really vibrant SME um, sector in the UK, as, as well as the larger industrial players. Uh, importantly, we have to work with the devolved administrations. So in the UK, um, there are certain competences devolved to the governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and they all have an interest in local growth and supporting economic development um, in those countries. So we work closely with them whilst we coordinate space policy for the UK as a whole. We do realise this crosses over with a lot of the interests of the devolved administration. So we, we work really closely with them to make sure we're on the same page. And I've mentioned it a couple of times already, the Harwell Space Cluster. Uh, so it's about 10 miles south of Oxford, I think. And you can see that in the top picture here. Um, the big shiny circle is the diamond light source, so a, a large synchrotron. Uh, so not actually a space facility. But there's the whole innovation campus there with uh, an ever growing number of, of space companies um, based there. And so we're looking to rebalance the space economy and create jobs across the UK. So this is part of a wider um, imperative uh, to try and make sure high skilled jobs and innovative uh, technology and research and development. Uh, isn't just concentrated in the southeast, but is, is spread throughout the UK. And um, we see ourselves as having a, an important role to play in that. We invest for science. Um, so over 40% of UK space programmes directly fund uh, science and research. Um, and this is really important for us. As I'm sure most of you know, we have a, a very good um, university and research sector in the UK. Um, and that's really helped um, help drive the UK space program over the years, whether that's building instrumentation or then using the data that comes back from space missions to, for, for new discoveries. So the international relations side of, of what the UK Space Agency does is really important as well. We work closely with, with partners in other parts of government, such as um, the Foreign Office in the UK. Um, and we think space is a really positive example of international cooperation 
and we're continuing to forge new agreements with with global partners um that's part of the reason for for speaking regularly in um in meetings like this we're really keen to work with colleagues in europe and and further afield as well we recognize there's a lot we can achieve together that we we can't do on our own i think our international partnership program is a really good example of this um so this is actually using um development funding for for developing nations um, helping them to use uh, space assets and space derived data to solve problems that they've got on Earth. So that can be in all kinds of things from agriculture to monitoring deforestation and a, a whole range of projects um, there. And with that, it's a really good example of demonstrating the value of our investment in space um, for people on Earth. Um, and also we work to uh, attract foreign direct investment um, and supporting the world's leading space companies um, where there's mutual benefit for them to come to the UK and, and work here with us. So we do have a, a legislative and uh, regulatory role as well. Um, and this is really fo focused on those three critical words being safe, secure and responsible use of space. So at the moment, the UK Space Agency uh, licenses in orbit satellites um and we're always looking at ways to make that licensing process smoother and easier for companies whilst always always recognizing that it must be done in a safe secure and responsible manner uh two years ago the space industry act uh, came into force in the uk um and this sets out uh the principles for how the launch of uh space objects from the uk itself will be undertaken and then there's a whole a whole tranche of more detailed regulations um, which sit under that act which uh, have recently been consulted on and we expect them to come into force next year uh, so this is um, perhaps one of the highest profile areas i work and something that's really important to, to everything we do uh, inspiring the next generation so um, Tim Peake, I'm sure many of you will recognise there in the, in the picture on the right. Um, so he is the UK's first ESA astronaut. Uh, he went to the International Space Station uh, end of 2015. Um, this is launching us up there for six months. And as part of that, we really use that as a hook to engage people in science, technology, engineering and maths, and a whole range of other subjects where we realise space really can be a, a catalyst for engaging young people in these subjects so we're not necessarily the experts in education but we work very closely with people who do deliver education um, to work on on programs which can can really use space as a resource and then that's a reciprocal thing in a way because we realize that the space sector in the uk needs more um, young people graduating um, from these areas and uh, so on innovation we fund um we fund companies through our national space technology program and our space for smarter government program um is helping the public sector here in the uk make better use of space data and services often um often public sector authorities and agencies don't realize how they can improve the service they deliver through the use of space data. So we support them to do that. And closest to my heart, um, we are leading the commercial space age in Europe. So that's quite a bold statement. Um, what we mean by that is um, we've got an ambition to enable commercial vertical and horizontal small satellite launch from UK spaceports from the early 2020s. Uh, you probably noticed we're already in the early 2020s, but that's something we're looking forward to, um, to seeing uh, taking place in the coming years. Um, so there's a few artists' impressions there on the slide of what that might look like. It won't just be vertically launched rockets. Um, we also expect uh, horizontally launched rockets. So where a conventional aircraft uh, takes off across the sea, and then launches uh, a rocket into space from there. Um, so we've awarded around 40 million pounds funding um, 
which is really to help kickstart some of these endeavors. And that's gone to a mixture of spaceports and uh, launch vehicle companies. And I've already mentioned the Space Industry Act, which will actually make it legal and, and safe to do this. So I'm going to dive into a bit more detail now on the spaceflight program itself. Um, so there's really four strands to how we are managing the spaceflight program in the UK. First of all, incentivizing the market. So this is basically the, the funding that I just mentioned um, to help put in place that infrastructure and the, the supply chain in the UK. Legislation is critical to make sure that um, government has the powers to be able to uh, allow for safe and secure launch activities. Regulation is the next layer of detail underneath that. So our, our draft regulations are, are published now if anybody wants to read them. And there's quite a lot of detail in there about how exactly um, we will license operators to make it safe to launch on the UK. That's doubly important because our program is a commercial launch program. We will be looking to uh, commercial actors to provide the launch vehicles, the spaceports, the range and range tracking um, services. So every part of it will be delivered commercially. Government's role is to make sure that that is all done in a safe manner. And we'll primarily do that through, through licensing those entities. And lastly, um, most significant for me is international engagement. So this is where, really where me and my team come in. Um, making sure we've got agreements um, with other countries where they're needed. So for example, we're speaking to countries to the north of the UK who may take an interest in, in trajectories which go over or near their territory to make sure they are uh, content with our plans and, and how we will manage safety and security and so forth. Um, also speaking to other countries such as the US, we reached, recently concluded a technology safeguards agreement with the US. And this is a bilateral treaty which allows for the, the export of US space technology, such as launch vehicles, to the UK to be operated and launched from the UK itself. So it's worth saying we don't see the value in launch purely in the act of, of getting the rocket in the air. There's a whole ecosystem around that which we're keen to support um, and, and see great opportunities for the commercial sector to deliver these. Um, and really our launch program, not, we're not just launching things for fun. Um, we say it's a, a critical part of the, the space value chain that isn't currently done in the UK. We're very good at building satellites. We're very good at using the data that comes back from satellites. We're very good at doing uh, science and exploration missions. The one thing that we don't really do in the UK yet is launch. So that's why we're taking this new approach to launch and enabling the commercial sector to deliver that from the UK. So in terms of where things may actually launch from, um, this uh, gives, gives an idea of where there are current, uh, current public plans for spaceports to be built and operated. So you can see the, the vertical launch sites are around the north coast of Scotland there and, and one just off the map um, on Shetland. And then horizontal launch sites, they're all based at existing airports. Uh, fundamentally, you need a long runway and, and the necessary facilities for, for handling the rocket and payload. Um, and you'll notice they're all near the coast so they can quickly get out over the sea and over into the Atlantic. Uh, where they're likely to be launching from. Probably worth saying that we don't expect spaceports in all these locations to, um, to be operational in the long term. Um, what we've done as government is not to specify one location. We've said anybody who meets the licensing requirements may in theory host a spaceport. Um, but it's really great to see that there is this diversity of interest. And, um, and yeah, I think in the in the longer term we'll see two or three of those being uh, successful ventures so that's a that's a, a quick summary of the space flight program um i thought it might be worth um going through just a few areas of future opportunities i thought particularly for for uh, you in iceland this, this may be of interest so 
we're always looking to expand. I do apologize. It appears there's some faint text in the background of this slide. Um, that's poor formatting there. Um, but anyway, um, we, we are expanding our international collaboration at the moment. Um, I'm always looking to work with new partners. And there may be some areas of interest to Iceland and always be interesting to hear feedback from, from the Icelandic community on these. So we're really keen to understand where our capabilities and interests might intersect with Iceland and then how, based on that, the UK Space Agency can help facilitate new partnerships. Um, so I've listed a few examples here, which, which I think could be uh, of mutual interest. So satellite applications, something where there's a lot of strength and heritage in the UK, using space assets for terrestrial purposes. That's across a whole range of things, agriculture, remote comms, uh, telemedicine is something we're seeing a lot of growth in at the moment, uh, smart cities for monitoring urban usage and then using that to inform urban planning and connectivity. Um, and I mean, a very obvious and topical, but very important area uh, in monitoring climate change as well. Uh, training is, is something which um, could be of interest, I think. Um, we have a really, um, really effective model in the UK uh, called spin terms, which is a kind of hackneyed uh, contraction of space interns. So this is offering internships um, in the in the space sector uh, to young people, um, or not necessarily young people, but people wishing to enter the, the space sector. Um, so the UK Space Agency facilitates a, a range of of internships across across different companies. Um, I mean, this could be in a whole host of areas: launch systems and spaceport operations, space systems engineering. Um, I mean. Uh, and really any other aspect of, of the space industry could be relevant there. Um, and also in CubeSat development, I know there's some interest in this in Iceland at the moment. Uh, I'm sure many of you will know that we have a very strong um, capability in CubeSats in the, in the UK with a, a couple of companies specialising in that. So that's something we have a real area of strength in and, and could partner on. Uh, in education and outreach, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, really important for us. Um, I'm repeating myself here, so it's bad formatting again. Um, but yeah, we're also looking at summer schools. Um, we could, if there's joint areas of interest, um, that's another model we find really effective is to have uh, relatively short joint uh, courses focusing on a, on a particular area, getting a group of experts and, and earlier career researchers together for, for an intense short period of study. And uh, academic collaboration. Um, I think um, academic collaboration across countries is, is uh, obviously something which happens uh, an awful lot and something we're always keen to facilitate more. because there's, there's always more benefit to, to collaborating widely. Um, so these are just some areas in which the UK has particular interests. Uh, I, could have, I could have listed more, but astronomy, astrobiology, climate science, novel materials, robotics, um, and there's, there's several areas, se several other areas as well in which uh, the UK does have a leading position. So that's my quick canter through the UK space sector. Um, I hope that was interesting for everyone. And um, there's an awful lot to cover there. So apologies if I did uh, speak too fast at all, but um, yeah, I'd be really happy to take any questions. Um, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen now as well, so I can I can see you all, if that will work. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we already have a question. Um, but I, if if I may, I'm just going to say that, as you might know, that um, you guys have might have seen it. There have been some uh, news reports about uh, the UK space agency's interest in working in Iceland. Uh, there was it's been a few months since there was some some uh, news about it, and I just want to say that from Space Iceland, I mean we've kind of a little bit been involved with that and I th what Andrew is um, saying isn't just like 
sort of empty diplomacy. It's actually, um, they have been quite keen to work in Iceland and they've been quite sort of patient and, and, and a nice partner to talk to. Uh, so as most of you might imagine, Space Iceland has been quite um, vocal about our support for more international uh, partnership because Iceland, although we do have some activity, we, we could really need and we would benefit greatly from working with stronger partners. But moving on to the question, Andrew, there's a, there's a question that was um, um, that was sent here uh, and it's a, it's a simple one. What, well, it's a big question, but it's a short one. What would uh, UK Space Agency like to learn about Iceland's interest, activities and aspirations? That is a big question. Uh, everything. Uh, no, I think um, key for us, and this is something we've, we've discussed a bit in the past, Paul, I think where there are areas of mutual interest and mutual benefit. Um, oh, my video. There we go. I think wherever there's areas of, of mutual interest and mutual benefit, um, that's something that, that we're interested to, to know about. We uh, we love working with, with people in other countries and I think there's a good broader relationship between Iceland and the UK, but we don't want to work together just for the sake of it and we're not going to do it unless we see there's mutual benefit for both parties. So maybe that's a bit of a vague answer, but I think anything where there are complementary strengths or something which Iceland can genuinely learn from the UK on or vice versa, where there's facilities or particular areas of interest um, and expertise in Iceland that the UK community can learn from, then we're interested in that um, and where we have mutual interests. Um, and that's really my guiding principle for this. Um, I could chat about all the things that we're interested in in the UK, but I really want to focus on those where there is genuine interest from both sides and mutual benefit. Thank you. There's already another question. Um, it's from uh, Petr at uh, Tech Space Alliance. It's the industrial body in the Czech Republic. Um, what differences did it make to change from BNC, BNSC to UK Space Agency? Um, I mean, we all had to change our email addresses, which was rather inconvenient. Um, but more substantially, BNSC was quite a small office within a big government department. Um, I think it was five or six people um, trying to coordinate the various space interests which were funded by other government departments. So I think changing to the UK Space Agency really gave us much more focus and clarity of direction. And then it was much easier for the UK to say, well, if we're investing in program X and we're investing in program Y, we need to make sure those investments are properly coordinated. Um, if this technology we're investing in through the general studies technology program could be useful for both the exploration programs and the earth observation programs, it allowed us to have a much more joined up strategy and decision making for that. Um, I'm sure it helped that it coincided with in increased uh, levels of government support financially for space programs um, at the same time. Um, but yeah, it really gave us, um, to put it less formally, it gave us more clout and a louder voice within government. And also when speaking to the sector, I think uh, both in the academic and the industrial side of, of the space sector in the UK, they really appreciated the fact that if they wanted to talk to government, they had one, they had one organization to talk to. They didn't have to phone up 10 different departments to get the answer they needed. There's one clear voice for, for the UK government in space. Thank you. Well, um, please send in more questions, uh, but I, I do have one, uh, if it's okay. Um, well, I mean, one of the interesting things about um, the UK legacy is that actually you, you guys used to be quite um, good when it came to launch and you, you had uh, launch capabilities um, and technology that actually quite a lot of the stuff that we're doing now builds on and mm -hmm. uh, then at some point that 
uh, knowledge does deteriorate a bit. Um, and there's a point to this question, not just to point out failures. Um, but um, and in some ways, we do have kind of similar story, obviously a, a lot less capacity, but there was a time where Iceland actually had quite a lot of uh, opportunities mm -hmm. to be involved quite early on. Um, and most of the, the knowledge and um, the experiences that we got from that have been lost and are now just kind of, well, I mean, the point now to reach it is that the National Archives. Um, and we've been trying here at Space Iceland to kind of reflect on some of these, not necessarily to point out like who is to blame or what is to blame, but more to kind of recover and, and understand where we should go in the future. Do you have any sort of thoughts on this? Because you've recently tried to rebuild and like that's now your new focus. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it's a subject that has been uh, intensely debated in the UK space sector, probably longer than I've been alive, I think. Um, yeah, it's something on which there are quite uh, quite strong views in the UK sector. Um, and we are the only country, I believe, to have had a launch capability and then abandoned it. Every other country that's, that's attained launch capability, quite a big undertaking, has then retained it and is still a launching state today. So that's a, a peculiar uh, record for the UK. I think it's, um, I, at the time, um, it's, it's obviously incredibly expensive to launch things in space and even more so uh, proportionally uh, back in the 70s when, when we abandoned our launch program and the government just prioritized other things. Um, there's a similar story with human spaceflight, which the UK didn't join in the 1980s when most of the other leading nations in Europe did. We, we prioritized other things which had more uh, immediate socio-economic returns. So we prioritized telecommunications technology, navigation technology. And actually that has seen the UK space sector be a bit of a hidden success story from, from the 1980s um, up until relatively recently when we're getting more attention and more publicity. So I think it's it's not a straightforward, um, there's not a straightforward answer to whether we were right or not to, to abandon launch capability um, back then. I think it was a matter of priorities at the time and things have turned out uh, all right. I think the sector now is in rude health and for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier, we see there's quite a lot of benefit as launch technologies are changing all the time, bringing down the cost of launch and also the flexibility of launch, the kinds of vehicles you can launch and the locations you can use. It does really make sense for the UK to re-enter that now, albeit in a completely different way. We're not there's not going to be a, a government owned or a government directed launch program. Um, the government might be a customer for launch, but we are not, um, yeah, we're not owning or directing any launch capabilities though, though we may wish to use it in the future. Um, we would expect the, the government to be one customer of many. There's a different, we're approaching launch in a different way now and doing it in a way that makes sense for the UK. Yes, so we we have a we have a few questions. Um, just a follow up on this one. I mean, how important is this legacy though? Because I mean, legacy at least here does play quite a quite a role in kind of normalizing the idea of space. Sure. I mean, in terms of normalizing it, I think the kind of um, the folk memory, the the cultural knowledge of space in the UK did recede a lot. Um, from say the late 60s, early 70s through to the 1990s, probably because we were doing the less obviously visible things. We weren't doing launches and we weren't doing human spaceflight. And those are the things which garner the most public interest for, for uh, obvious reasons, I suppose. Um, they are the most exciting and visual parts of, of space. Um, so I'm not sure how relevant that legacy is today of, of our previous launch program. Um, I think probably what's more relevant is the growth over the past 10, 15 years of the UK space sector as a whole um, and of our satellite manufacturing capability 
in particular. And we see a real attraction for satellite manufacturers being closer to the, uh, the point of launch. Um, that's one of the reasons why, why we're supporting commercial launch in the UK. But I think it's probably more our recent history which has shaped our, our current approach rather than, than older legacies. Thank you. I'm going to pass the word over to Otter at the University of Akureyri. Uh, Otter, please unmute and ask your question. Thank you, and uh, and thank you for your for the introduction. It was quite interesting. Um, although I, I have to confess, I, I missed part of it. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I, I I just I just noticed that you you mentioned uh, summer courses uh, earlier, and uh, I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with uh, with the uh, summer programs we've been running here uh, for a while now. Uh, there are several of these ongoing, especially in, in regards to well, geology on the one hand and astrobiology on the other, which is sort of my my field. And uh, so both we up here in Akureyri and also also uh, the University of Iceland and others have been running a number of, of summer courses, many of which uh, are probably of, of interest. Um, so uh, in my case, just to, which is of course just an example, in my case, I'm, I'm um, the summer courses I run are, are with uh, with uh, with, the, with the University of Reading on the one hand and uh, and a couple of universities in the states and. Uh, and in Colombia and the other, um, uh, we are focused, uh, admittedly only partly on, on astrobiology. But is this something that would be of interest to you guys in terms of, uh, you know, simply uh, 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 sim simply getting to know what we're doing, but also on, uh, with possibly with participation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so I think where Academics will always collaborate across borders, right? Um, often it's better if government steps back and gets out of the way and doesn't introduce more, more hurdles to that. Um, having said that, I think if there is a role for us to play in, in helping to facilitate that, or it sounds like you've already got a successful model, if this, that's something we can expand on where there's mutual interest on both sides, then, then yeah, I'd be really happy to speak about that further um, directly perhaps. Um, and see, yeah, what what the UK Space Agency can do to to help with that. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, our, our astrobiology community is um, large and ever growing in the UK. Um, with you know, there's been a particular focus on Mars exploration, but actually much broader than that. And um, that's definitely an area um, of keen interest uh, in the UK and also within within the UK Space Agency. Um, I used to do a bit of work in that area myself within the agency. Um, but yeah, maybe that's something we could, we could discuss uh, further in future. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to get our, our space exploration team involved in any such discussions too. Good. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, at these meetings, it's, uh, we always have a bit of flattery. Um, and I want to mention that Otter is involved in quite a lot of impressive projects when it comes to space. And we were quite fortunate to actually meet Otter when we were setting up uh, Space Iceland, which was called the Space Cluster at the time, or something like that, um, when we had um, astronaut trainings up north, which the University of Akureyri <laughs> was involved with. Um, so that there's was, a, that, was a, that was absolutely, uh, it was, we still remember that. Yes, there's there's another there's another question question here, and I'm going to read that. It's from Arthur. Uh, it, given Brex, the Brexit situation, will the UK participate in the EU space program? And if so, does the UK space agency put the same emphasis in participating in the European Space Agency and the EUSP? What are the major benefits on each side of participation? So, take it away. Uh, so we are, well, we have indeed left the EU um, and the, the transition period will end in um, just over a month. So um, we are withdrawing from the EU space programmes um, and we are looking to replicate the benefits of those where we can on a national level. 
Um, uh, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, this doesn't affect our membership of ESA. Um, ESA does deliver some programs on behalf of the EU, but uh, countries like Norway, Switzerland um, are full members of, of uh, ESA as well. So, um, so yes, we won't be participating in the major EU space programs in the future. All right. Uh, there's another question from um, from Artnor, which I just a follow up question. Um, do you see benefits of launching opportunities in Iceland? Launch paths direct to overseas areas with low air traffic volume, less conflict, and uh, and what launch cap capabilities could you see? Sounding rockets with scientific equipment, high atmospheric research, and Aurora or perhaps nano or CubeSat loads? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I guess it would be a different proposition for the Iceland from the UK in a way. I, I think one of our key selling points um, is you can, you can access polar and sun synchronous orbits from the UK. Um, but we are quite close to the manufacturing base as well. Um, Iceland is a li little more uh, uh, remote, I suppose, from, from mainland Europe than we are. Um, so that's one of what we see as one of the key benefits is very close and very um, plugged in. And also for, for UK-based companies not having to go through any import-export. Um, I mean, all those advantages of, of launching from Iceland that you mentioned, I suppose they are all valid. Um, and there are there are, um, it seems every week I hear about new proposed spaceports somewhere in the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, that would be potential uh, in that price end. I suppose much like us, the weather is perhaps not always so welcoming, um, which is a, a similar challenge to, to what we may face uh, on the north coast of Scotland. Um, so yeah, there could be potential there. I probably shouldn't encourage the competition, should I? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure there could be potential for Iceland, but it is a big undertaking. I mean, what we're finding in the UK is, even though this model, which I've described of, of really allowing the commercial sector to build, own and operate all the facilities and the launch vehicles, so that takes a big uh, burden away from the government, purely doing the work of regulating, making sure it's safe and secure, having those agreements with international partners where you need them to import and export, purely doing that work is quite a big project. So there's there's a lot of staff, um, not just in the UK Space Agency, but in our Department for Transport and our Civil Aviation Authority working on that. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a fun undertaking, but, but not one to be done lightly, I suppose. Hi. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you for that. There's a there's another question here. Um, does Icelandic geothermal technology offer technologies of interest for planetary exploration? It's quite a quite a good question. Uh, that's a great question. That's uh, that's I, I confess it's not something I thought about. Um, yeah, I suppose there may well be some read across. Um, particularly when we are looking to study the interiors of other planets or, or planetary bodies, um, moons and so forth in our solar system. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the observation technologies would be used uh, for doing that terrestrially would be easily translated to that. Um, that's a really good question that's outside of my expertise, but um, yeah, that might be an interesting thing to look into actually. Um, all right. Um, well, we we don't have any um, further questions um, that have been sent to me at least, uh, and we're about we're like right on time. But I mean, there is a bit of a tradition here, which is whenever um, Helgi shows up, I kind of force him to ask something and speak. Um, Helgi is an MP. He is the guy behind the parliamentary resolution to join the European Space Agency. 
Um, and I know he's probably not a fan of this, but uh, we keep doing it. So Helki, do you want to say a few words and tell us about what's happening um, politics-wise? Um, <clears throat> well, not much happening politics-wise, unfortunately, at the moment. But um, I'm hoping that that's going to change when COVID-19 stops being the, the focal point of everything that we do. Um, I was interested in, in hearing about the opportunities in education in particular. In fact, Otter, he, he kind of just went through what I ha was wondering myself, uh, because one of the things that um, I, I do use with my colleagues in politics in order to um, try to strengthen some interest in this is mentioning opportunities on education in particular in how to get people and young people and children involved in, in STEM or STEAM fields. So um, um, that's sort of the, uh, the next step as, I can, as, I, as far as I can tell in terms of convincing the politicians. That said, we're gonna have elections next September, inshallah, and uh, the new government after that will, well, we don't know what that's gonna look like but I, I do foresee education being sort of one of those places where we can actually um, show that this is a realistic and, and a proper thing for a small country like Iceland to do. It's the same story here as with any small country. It's, it's the difficulty in convincing politicians that, this, that, that Iceland has something to offer, that this is relevant to us. But like um, Atli mentioned in the beginning, that's improving. And I've found that it's improving rather fast lately I found it um, more easy, constantly easier to to address the topic with other fellow politicians and and people in the field. I don't really know what much else to say except that uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, it's very interesting. I'm wondering if you could have a copy of those uh, of that presentation because I would love to go through some of that stuff uh, in my own time to research it further. Um. Andrew, do you want to respond to that? Well, then I got okay. Uh, well, okay. Uh, there's some some technical issue, um, but yeah, uh, I think Andrew has gone. So maybe, and our time is is up. Um, We'll, it, yeah. we'll, um, we'll see if Andrew can respond. Andrew, does your microphone work? No, uh, yeah, he's out. Well, thanks guys for the, the meeting. If there are any questions, you can obviously send them to us. Oh, Andrew is, here, is back. Do you want to respond to that? You have to unmute your microphone. Many apologies. I think my feed cut out just as Helki was beginning to speak. Um, I was frantically trying <laughs> trying to join back. Uh, well, so apologies for that. Uh, I can kind of reiterate if Helki doesn't want to. He, he was speaking about education initiatives and how uh, uh, he used it. Uh, there are offers of educational initiatives and cooperations that you made. I mean, and I want to say that the UK has actually made quite a grand offer to Iceland when it comes to uh, partnership. So um, obviously we should be looking at it quite seriously. Uh, Helki, do you want to reiterate or should I just? Uh, sure, I can reiterate and I'll be quicker this time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one of the things I wanted to, to uh, learn more about, actually Otter went through uh, with you already in terms of these summer, summer courses and such. But one of the things that I have found is relatively easy to get my fellow politicians on board with are things that might work well to increase um, STEM education among children in particular, and to sort of um, uh, make that whole area of study more appealing and exciting for children and kids and young people in general. So um, yeah, I, I don't suppose I have a question except like just if you have any recommendation on how to move forward with something like that with regard to how, you, how to use a space program to, to achieve that. Yeah, and I think it's something which is 
I mean, it's like magic. As soon as you mention space, um, particularly with 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 children, um, school age children, uh, you can almost see the light bulb turn on, um, and you can see that engagement and that that excitement. Um, I've seen it myself when when visiting schools. Um, suddenly, um, you're talking about space, and you're actually basing it on real space programs that have been done in their country. Um, maybe so in Bristol, where I am. I can be talking about people who are half a mile away um, actually doing this research in the university down the road or to the north of Bristol, they might be building these actual satellites, you know, it, within within walking distance from where these children actually live. It makes it much more real for them. Um, so that's definitely something that we see firsthand. I think um, obviously different countries have different curricula, uh, different priorities of how they communicate, um, particularly with school age children. So I think using space, but then tailoring it um, to the, the existing educational requirements and priorities is really important. Um, when we see kind of educational initiatives fail, it's normally because somebody said, I'm doing something in space, it's really interesting. Here, learn about this children. And that's completely the wrong approach. You have to speak to the teachers, find out what their priorities are, and then work collaboratively to see how space can actually enrich what they need to to impart already, and that's really the the approach we've we've taken, um, and and we've seen be really successful. It helps to have an astronaut. That, that would be my advice, but you, you don't have to have an astronaut. Um, we did see a big uptick in in interest after Tim Peake's mission to the RSS. Um, but actually, we've sustained that since, and not just through astronauts. Uh, programs, but through a whole range of things, it is something that catches the imagination. Um, so we're we're always happy to to share our experiences and any insights. Um, and yeah, obviously, always mindful of the need to then tailor that to to the audience um, to make sure it is relevant and worthwhile. Thank you. Thankfully, we have an astronaut, Bjarne Tryggvason, and mm. yet another example of uh, this unbelievable contribution by Icelanders to space, uh, despite no national program. Um, but thank you for that. Thank you guys for um, attending the meeting. It's, it's always a pleasure that we get to have these meetings. It's the last one this year, so I'll say just happy holidays. And in, in January, we have uh, we have quite an exciting meeting actually in January. Um, so uh, we'll have two speakers then. It's uh, August, which uh, worked on behalf of the Icelandic government when the French launched their four rockets in 64. He's going to go over some of that. And we've been able to retrieve uh, quite a lot of um, documents and, and, um, and photos from the National Archives from those four launches. And then we have uh, uh, oh, what? What's the name again? Uh, we then we have uh, someone from Mansat, Mansat or ISAT, uh, which uh, they do. Um, they register. You can register satellites, obviously, through Iceland, and that's the company that does it. And they've recently set up base in in Iceland. Um, and I am so poor with names. Thankfully, uh, Zoom, for instance, has your names underneath. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the speaker, but it's going to be an interesting talk, and I hope to see all of you then. All right, guys, thank you, and happy holidays. Thank you. Everyone, thanks, all.